All right, so I'm kind of pumped that uh, actually got a lot of hits. <clears throat> so wanted to go ahead and throw this uh, breakdown together. So I wanted to kind of just uh, start by talking about like the practical takeaways that I got from this. Uh, number one, this is a great justification for how our anatomy is not an exact and incomplete science. We need to think a little bit beyond what we're taught and what we're told in our conventional and academic settings. Number two, uh, the demand for rigidity and singular pursuits of, of max effort and, and max uh, force outputs in strength and conditioning settings is again not wrong, but it's an incomplete strategy. Uh, number three, the interconnectedness not just of fascial tissue in terms of it being connected with itself and being continuous throughout the body, but then also to this uh, direct interfacing with muscle fibers, muscle spindles, and kind of being situated in between adjacent muscular compartments. So I thought this was a really cool, cool study. Definitely recommend checking this out in full, but let's break this thing down a little bit. All right, so I think the first reason that this study in particular just really stuck out to me and really resonated with me is that it, it gave extremely good and comprehensive validation for what I've, I've believed for a very long time in that the, the foundations of our conventional anatomy are not necessarily wrong, but it is an incomplete and a definite inexact science. And I think that the, the more that we uncover and discover about the fascial anatomy and how the fascial tissue and system uh, influences and relates to what we see and describe as human movement, mechanics, force excursions, and outputs, and so forth. So with that being said, uh, the you know there's a couple of different points throughout this study that I wanted to identify and share. And, uh, you know, we'll go through these a little bit in more detail as we go along. But overall, really, it's just the explanation of the, the three-dimensional nature and the, the non-linearity and multiple uh, or the multi-vector arrangement or structure of fascia and of what they describe as epimuscular connective tissue. So the term that they use in this study is epimuscular. That's kind of the emphasis or the focal point of, of this non-linearity force transmission. But as we can see through this schematic here, everything ultimately relates back to the same thing. It all goes back to the skeleton. So we have the conventional longitudinal transmission of forces where we have muscle to tendon to skeleton, but then we also have all of these underlying mechanisms that also produce forces or transmit forces to the skeleton. So these are going to include our intramuscular or within the same muscle. This is going to particularly include our myotendinous and our myofascial tissues. Those are going to transmit from the muscle to the tendon in somewhat of just a little bit of a, of a rerouted direction, we'll say. Then we have the epimesium, which is essentially the connective tissue that's enveloping muscle fibers. And that is going to part into the epimuscular connective tissue. And then this is going to then be broken down into intermuscular and extra, extramuscular. So with intermuscular, we're still staying within muscle tissue or tendon, and this is going to essentially be adjacent structures that are going to help transmit force. So we'll see an example of that in a minute here with the gastrox and the soleus. But then we have the extramuscular uh, routing of force, which is going to go through non-muscular structures. So this can refer to different types of fascial tissue that are, that are enveloping or surrounding the area, um, or it can speak to the neurovascular tracts, which are also um, contributing to this force transmission process. But Again, the, the key takeaway here is that the muscle to tendon to bone route of force transmission is not telling the complete story. An illustration or an animation rather of what they just what they just described to be a theoretical muscle, but this is essentially showing not just the enveloping fascial tissue, but also the neurovascular tracts that are going to be situated in between uh, adjacent muscles and in, in, in between adjacent structures. So as we can see through this, even though it is just an animation, it is really, really difficult for me at least to try to understand force transmissions as being so selectively biased to just one tissue or one structure when everything has this inter interwoven or overlapping connectivity between it. So between the nerves that are intersecting and, and supplying agonist and antagonist muscle groups to the ECM and again, just the intermuscular, I'm sorry, extra muscular structures that are going to be situated in between our muscular tendinous structures. These are all things that are going to play a role in the way that we are transmitting and experiencing forces. Showing the difference in force production uh, or, or force generated 
at both the distal and the insertional sites of a muscle. And this is just, again, good evidence of something that I believe for a long time that uh, the distribution of force across a muscle is not just longitudinal. And it's not this, you know, even distribution on either end of the muscle because of the extra muscular and epimuscular connective tissue or connective sites throughout and across the muscles and between these adjacent muscular compartments this distribution is going to be different and variable depending on the constituent factors surrounding it so again it's things like foot position or pressure knee angle chest position how the, the movement is loaded and this is good evidence of why we should see variability in the training setting yeah that really jumped out at me and uh, looking at this graph here essentially what we're seeing here is the theoretical uh, force summation based on what uh, multiple uh, contributing muscles can produce based on theoretical predictions or projections so taking the summation of those and what they're suggesting in this study is that essentially it's it, it becomes a, a lot more than that or the force generation can be uh, much higher than that because we are not accounting for these epimuscular connections uh, that are also transmitting forces that are essentially being remiss through the mat. So another good example that they show here is how knee position or degree of knee flexion or extension influences the epimuscular force transmission between the soleus and the gastrox. So as we know about these two muscles, the gastroc is going to cross both the knee and the ankle joint, whereas the soleus is not going to uh, cross the knee joint. So between these two tissue or between these two muscles, they share a common junction or common tendon through the Achilles tendon. And when we have a presence of knee extension, um, there is a change in the relationship or force distribution between the soleus and the gastroc. And this essentially creates a uh, you know, a better efficiency or ergonomics of force distribution where we're not getting uh, the, the same uh, excessive or repetitive stress on the same exact structure. So this justifies, in a sense, why I'm so big on positional variability through training, because we are changing things of this nature. The other thing that's interesting that they mentioned, and I'll touch it real quick, is that the, the influence of uh, compressive forces, basically, essentially, the muscle belly uh, increasing the local pressure of the area, also having a change in the distribution of how these forces are distributed extramuscularly.